All right. Hello, everyone, and thank you for coming to the inaugural event of the 15th Annual Platypus International Convention. The Platypus Affiliated Society, established in December 2006, organizes reading groups, public fora, research, and journalism focused on problems and tasks inherited from the old 1920s and 30s, new 1960s and 70s, and post-political 1980s and 90s left for the possibility of emancipatory politics today. This afternoon's workshop, Marxism and Radical Republicanism, will be led by Luke Pickrell, a member of the Marxist Unity Group faction of the Democratic Socialists of America. Founded as a faction within the Democratic Socialists of America, the Marxist Unity Group has advocated for the DSA to break with the Democratic Party and build an independent socialist party. Among other things, MUG calls for the overthrow of the antiquated slaveholder constitution to be replaced by a truly democratic republic of the working class. At this event, Luke will present on Marxism and radical republicanism and how these traditions matter for Monk's political orientation today. It is Monk's contention that the socialist movement should champion the demand for a democratic socialist republic in North America, and Pickrell's presentation will expl explicate Marxist republicanism as freedom from domination, the history of the Paris Commune and the Second International, and the strategy for our present movement. Uh, give him a warm round of applause. Okay, well, thanks, Ben. Um, yeah, and first off, just thank you all for letting me come out here and talk with you about something that I find interesting and that I really enjoy talking about. Uh, before I get going, I you know, was just thinking, it was actually at a, the Platypus Convention last year where um, it was, I believe it was Ben Studebaker and, and his presentation on, on liberalism that just at the very end uh, he mentioned Bruno Leopold, uh, and he actually ended his talk by saying, like, oh, sure, I'll use the microphone. Um, I just thought it was funny that, that Ben ended his talk then talking about Bruno Leopold, who I'd never heard of at the time. Um, and now, you know, as I'll talk about, Bruno Leopold is actually someone who, who influences a lot of, you know, this thinking and what So, a fun, a fun little coincidence. So I'll talk... Um, 30, 35 minutes or so. Um, hopefully bring up some some interesting questions, some interesting points, and then I figure we can we can have a nice conversation. And though I'm reading, I'm gonna try and look up as much as possible because I know sometimes if someone's reading something, it's a little bit busy. So the, the final point of Marxist Unity Group's points of unity calls for a democratic socialist republic in North America. I'll jump around a little bit in this talk, but hopefully I'll remain connected to the red thread of this demand. First, I'm gonna to touch on why the demand for a democratic socialist republic isn't a part of contemporary left discourse. And then I'll talk a little bit about the history of Marx as a democratic Republican and the goings on within the Second International after his death. After that, I'll, I'll focus on an influential take on Marxism and Republicanism found in William Clare Roberts' books, Mar uh, books Marx's Inferno, in which Roberts presents Marx's conception of freedom as non-domination. And then I'll try and bring us up to the present and explain why Marx's republicanism and the demand for a democratic socialist republic is important and what that demand tasks the, less, tasks the left with today. Now, I've talked about this topic uh, with folks from different left backgrounds, and, and you know, folks have different reactions to what I present, these aren't my ideas necessarily. This is, this is still a very live question in my mind, and I'm still working around these ideas. And I, I kind of liken it to a little bit of uh, as if you know when one picks up a rock in a way, and you know if there are ants or whatever underneath that kind of scurry in all different directions. So you know you pick up one thing, and then all these different things come out. But hopefully it's going to come together in some kind of cohesive structure. Luke, there's a, the, the online audience is having a little bit of difficulty hearing. If you can hold the mic sure, a bit. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah. Happy to. Thank you. Yeah. So, history of this demand. What's this demand? So, the demand for a democratic republic is, is certainly not in the vocabulary of the existing communist, Maoist, or Trotskyist parties, nor is it a demand consistently championed by the Democratic Socialists of America or authors published in the popular Jacobin magazine, though there are a few articles about the subject. That while Leon Trotsky referred to the Democratic Republic in his mid-1930s writings on France, the demand disappeared from Communist Party programs after the Russian Revolution. It remained submerged within a sea of Cold War discourse, which split the world between Western democracies and various dictatorships and totalitarian powers. 
with Marxism and the somewhat, somewhat problematic Leninism lumped in with the latter. Both the United States and the Soviet Union had an interest in portraying their respective political systems as emblematic of democracy. Lost in all this, I'd say, is what Marx actually says about democracy, democratic republicanism, and what the state form of the dictatorship of the proletariat looks like. And it wasn't the USSR. Today, when the left speaks of democracy, it's often in combination with the pejorative bourgeois and, and scorned as such. Communism is seen as somehow better than or distinct from democracy, or, or democracy is seen as just a means to an end. Republicanism is, is similarly treated as, and I'm quoting here, entirely reducible to petite bourgeois ideology that undermines the working class struggle and is hence unworthy of serious study. As Bruno Leopold points out, uh, the preeminent source of Marx's thought, the, I'm not going to try and pronounce the German name, the mega, refers to democratic republicanism as, quote, mere petty bourgeois windbags. In their distaste for the existing rule of undemocratic constitutional law and order that goes by the name of democracy, I'd argue that socialists have thrown out the baby with the bathwater. <clears throat> it seems to me as if everything Marx, Engels, and the Second International ever, ever wrote about democracy, the democratic republic and the state form of the dictatorship of the proletariat, went out the window, essentially, after the Russian Revolution. To a large extent, a particular reading of Lenin's state and revolution, one that focuses on references to the Soviets and largely ignores what Marx said about the Paris Commune, became the definitive statement on what the worker state would look like. The true Marxist, we're told, is one who dreams of the workers taking state power, uh, envisions workers' councils, actually, excuse me, back up, a true Marxist who is someone who dreams of the workers taking state power. That person envisions workers' councils and not a democratic republic. And if you want a democratic republic, you want something called bourgeois democracy, and then, aha, you know, you've revealed yourself as a real Marxist. Another reason I think why much of the left rejects the idea of a democratic republic is that they misunderstand the task of the working class once it takes political power. Communism is not realized once the working class comes to power. Instead, the class struggle continues under capitalism, but at a higher level, and with the working class finally in a position to eliminate private property and commodity production because it controls the state. The revolution is a two-step process. Additionally, some sections of the left exemplify what I would consider an economistic approach is that they think only those demands which the workers are already conscious of are appropriate to take up. So if the workers aren't currently demanding the abolition of the standing army or the abolition of the Senate, then neither should socialists. Finally, I think there are some leftists who consciously or unconsciously remain trapped in what I'll call kind of an insurrectionary mode of thinking, which I think is best exemplified in the idea that the working class could take state power now if only it had the correct leadership. And I kind of think about how I started off floating around the Socialist Equality Party and that's kind of how I was first taught to see the world in a sense. Um, I'm relatively confident that this comes from a particular interpretation of Trotsky in that it sees capitalism as rotten and as such is ripe for socialism. And therefore the fight for democracy is a distraction from the fight for socialism. So there's a real sense of urgency in a certain sense. Today, one might not know that Karl Kautsky called democracy the light and air of the workers' movement. Rose Luxemburg later exposed Kautsky as a renegade before Lenin over the demand for a democratic republic in 1910. Friedrich Engels critiqued the German Social Democratic Party's Erfurt program for not demanding the democratic republic. And the 1912 program of the Socialist Party of America demanded the abolition of federal courts and the Senate, the overturning of national laws only by the vote of the people, and a constitutional convention. And here I'm quoting from the program. Such measures of relief as we may be able to force from capitalism, declares their 1912 program, are but a preparation of the workers to seize the whole powers of government in order that they may thereby lay hold of the whole system of socialized industry and thus come to their rightful inheritance. In 1892, Engels reiterated, quote, Marx and I for 40 years repeated ad nauseum that for us the democratic republic is the only political form 
in which the struggle between the working class and the capitalist class can first be universalized and then culminate in the decisive victory of the proletariat. And what of Marx himself? His comments on the Paris Commune are the clearest evidence that he imagined working class political power taking the form of a democratic republic, and not the type of so-called democratic republic found in the United States of France at the time. Only recently, I think, due in part to a re-examination of secondary national Marxism and challenges to the historiography of official communist parties and various Marxologists and Leninologists, is the centrality of democratic republicanism to Marxism emerging. Still, the demand for a democratic republic is scarcely heard outside of a few individuals in the academy. The Communist Party USA, a century old splinter from the SBA, advocates for democracy while leaving the US Constitution intact. The Socialist Workers Party also defends the Constitution, claiming that it protects citizens from government abuse and enshrines rural Americans' rights to represent the Senate, excuse me, to, for representation in the Senate. And this is my own little thought, but I have an interest if this is kind of connected to the SWP's talk of kind of workers and farmers. Still, I, I do think that any interest in reevaluating the past and challenging our existing myths is a promising development. Our task is to find what lies buried under layers of history, both actual and invented, and it's only by drawing the correct lessons from history that we can improve our work in the present. So I'm now going to jump into a little bit of the nuts and bolts history, I think. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about the second international and then bring us up to the present a little bit. So I'm going to talk a little bit about, about history, uh, Marx and his relationship to republicanism. Normally, and when I've talked about this in the past, I present this history through the lens of Bruno Leopold and Richard Hunt, uh, two historians, who's um, they really emphasize uh, works like the Critique of Hegel's Philosophy of Right, published in 1843, on the Jewish question in 1844, and the critical notes uh, on the King of Prussia, also in 1844, as examples of Marx's development from republicanism to a republican communist synthesis. It's actually Leopold who uses the phrase radical republicans, and I have to apologize that that's kind of the only time I'm going to use that phrase in this talk even though I know it's in the title of the presentation. It's all going to turn out well, I think. Uh, it's only, it, it's Bruno Leopold who uses the phrase radical Republicans to describe Republican thinkers who pushed for democracy at the political and social level, but who Marx eventually critiqued for not consistently encroaching on the rights of private property or for engaging in political alliances <laughs> with the parties. What I'm going to do now, however, just briefly, is look at Marx's republicanism through the works of Alex Gorovich and Sean Monaghan, who discuss the influence of the American workers, what Gorovich calls, who Gorovich calls the labor republicans, on Marx and the earlier uh, European socialist movement. So I think it's interesting to learn that Marx initially thought that the French Revolution of 1789 had achieved, had achieved something akin to human freedom by creating a democratic state. When Marx turned his attention toward the Americas, however, in the early 1940s, excuse me, 1840s, the United States was a constitutional republic with higher levels of suffrage than anywhere in Europe, and its president was a member of a political party with democracy in its name. But in reading descriptions of the United States by Alexis de Tocqueville, Thomas Hamilton, and Gustave de Dumont, Marx quickly learned that political freedom doesn't equate to social freedom. A state can't be democratic, and the people can't be free so long as private—excuse me—so long as property remains private and not social. Traditionally, Republicans had described freedom as the ability to control one's labor, but by the end of the 19th century, the conditions of permanent wage labor had eliminated any semblance of control over the labor process. These worker citizens of a nominal republic critiqued their country within the republican tradition. Reviewing what he terms the labor republican movement, Alex Gorovich concludes, here I'm going to quote him for a little bit, the best chance republicanism had of transcending its aristocratic origins and of developing an egalitarian critique of enslavement and, sub and subjection was when someone other than society's dominant elite 
used Republican language to articulate its concerns. This is precisely, and this is Gorbachev continuing, this is precisely what happened when 19th century artisans and wage laborers appropriated and inherited concepts of independence and virtue and applied them to labor relations. The attempt to universalize, and I'm, you know, in my notes I drew a little circle around universalize to make sure I emphasized universalize, the language of Republican liberty and the conceptual innovations that took place in the process were their contribution to this political tradition. That's the end of the quote from Gordon. These workers, the, the labor Republicans, they understood that freedom supposedly gained under the Republic wasn't living up to its potential in the face of wage labor, in which the workers sold away his body and his mind for the majority of the day. Wage slavery was a popular term to describe the discrepancy between the idea of freedom and the reality of unfreedom. For he, and this is a quote, in all countries is a slave who must work more for another man than others must work for him, wrote Thomas Skidmore, who was the founder of the Working Men's Party in New York. Skidmore continues, it does not matter how this state of things is brought about, whether the sword of victory hew down the liberty of the captive and thus compel him to labor for his conqueror, or whether the sword of want extort or consent, as it were, to a voluntary slavery through a denial to us of the materials of nature. Knights of Labor leader and first international member Terence Powderly likewise explained how wage labor made, quote, slaves of men who proudly but thoughtlessly boast of their freedom. That freedom which they claim came down to us from revolutionary sires as a heritage. Powderly wonders aloud, are we the free people who we imagine that we are? Finally, labor leader George McNeil described the American wage laborer as someone who assents but does not consent, who submits but does not agree. Contemporary scholars have presented various interpretations, I think, of various interpretations of Marx's earlier Republican views and his later commitment to communism. Richard Hunt explains that when Marx and Engels began their collaboration in 1845, both agreed that the institutions of government and decision-making in a classless society wouldn't be separate or estranged from the masses. This element of estrangement from the masses, by the way, is a big part of Marx's earlier writings on the Sunday. There would be no division between state and civil society. Both of these young revolutionaries had a profound faith, and they would continue to have that faith, in the proletarian masses to use democracy to realize their interests. Given the opportunity, the working class would act in a way that represents its interests. The chance, though, the problem is given at that opportunity. Universal suffrage, freedom of the press, and freedom of association would lead to socialism. Bruno Leopold contends that Marx questioned his initial republicanism after witnessing the bourgeoisie portray the revolutions of 1848, when, quote here, the new French Republic sent in the army to ruthlessly crush the insurgent workers who had naively believed that the Republic would be theirs. Only though to find a, a communist Republican synthesis after seeing the internal structure of the Paris Commune. Again, that's Leopold's interpretation of the Civil History. In his interpretation of Das Kapital, William Clare Roberts calls Marx's Republican communist synthesis a marriage between the concern for freedom and a systematic dissection of capital. More recently, Gil Schaefer has traced the Republican thread, and perhaps we can say it's more of a thick rope you know, at this point, through Marx's life, writing that, quote, of the three sources and component parts of, parts of Marxism, English political economy, German philosophy, and French revolutionary republicanism and socialism, Marx and Engels critique and modify all three save for the democratic republic, retaining its principles unchanged from its origin in the French Revolution as the state form of the dictatorship of the proletariat. At no point did Marx or Engels renounce their commitment to the political rule of the working class as the first step towards winning the class struggle and realizing a classless society. At no point did Marx or Engels renounce democracy as how the working class would come to power. Whether or not the ruling class would push back against that expansion of democracy with violence 
and whether or not that reaction would necessitate a violent revolution was another matter. The first fundamental condition, and I'm quoting Engels, for the introduction of, of the community of property is the political liberation of the proletariat through a democratic constitution, stated Engels in 1847. One year later, in the uh, manifesto of the Communist Party, Communist manifesto, Marx and Engels declared that the first step in the revolution by the working class is to raise the proletariat to the position of the ruling class to win the battle for the Marx. So here I'm going to take a little bit of a digression, but I hope it's not too much of one. Um, and talk a little bit about the Second International. And this is history after Marx has died, certainly, and then soon to be after Engels has died. So the French Third Republic was declared in, in September of 1870. Karl Kautsky detailed the numerous ways that the French Third Republic was far less democratic than, than the previous empire of Napoleon III. The critique from the German Social Democratic Party's leading theorist was so biting that he was compelled to write a lengthy piece explaining why the SPD wasn't secretly monarchist. Despite its name, Kautsky explained, the French Third Republic was just what Engels had called it years before. It was a monarchy with a president at its head. The modern state, to use a phrase from the pre-communist Marx of 1840, had replaced the monarch with the rule of the people only in a formal and not in a substantive manner. And I want to kind of tie that back to what these labor Republicans were talking about in the US, this idea of formal versus substantive differences. With the Republic as its sacred banner, the bourgeoisie succeeded in winning over large sections of the French working class and some socialists like Alexandre Mouron by trumpeting the sanctity of its supposed democracy against the alleged threat of a monarchical and clerical reaction. The bourgeoisie, explained Jeffrey Isaacs in a seminal work on Marx's republicanism, donned the, quote, lion skit of republican language to hide its eminently undemocratic nature. The trick was effective. The word, that is, republic, had a magical effect on the minds of the worker. This fata morgana fills them with hope wrote a historian of the time who was quoted by Kautsky. Even in the United States, where the struggle between worker and employer had reached a fever pitch by the end of the century, the working class eventually fell under the sway of what Kautsky calls Republican superstitions. Kautsky skates, and this is a bit of a longer quote here, the American worker still believes that thanks to his democracy, he's better than workers living under monarchies and that he has no need for socialism a mere product of the European despotism. The main task of our American comrades, continues Kowski, is to make the workers see reason, that just like in a monarchy, democracy has become a tool of class rule, that democracy can only again become a tool to break this class rule when he has overcome its Republican superstitions. End quote. The American working class, at least according to Kowski, um, would have forgotten their predecessors' understanding of the difference between form and content. The meaning of democratic republicanism needed rescuing from its bourgeois usurpers. And I will pause here just for a moment to say that Kautsky's authority on who's under the sway of republican superstitions and who is not is contested. Um, I think it's a little too easy and therefore very enticing to point to a group of folks and say that they don't understand the undemocratic nature of the state. And as a friend of mine told me, you don't have to be a socialist to have a political consciousness. So that's just a little asterisk there next to, next to Kautsky's statement. Almost a decade before Kautsky's criticism of the French Republic, Engels critiqued the SPD's 1891 Erica program for its failure to demand a democratic republic and for their failure to appreciate the significance of its, albeit necessary, a mission from party literature. If one thing is certain, wrote Engels, it's that our party and the working class can only come to power under the form of the Democratic Republic. The Russian Social Democratic Party did what the Germans couldn't, or wouldn't, in putting the demand for a Democratic Republic in their 1903 party program. And Lenin polemicized against members of his own party because they called themselves Social Democrats but weren't championing the political movement 
for a democratic republic as it was the Tsar. If you were willing to fight for political freedom, explained Solaris Lee, you were Lenin's ally, even if you were hostile to socialism. If you downgraded the goal of political freedom in any way, you were Lenin's foe, even if you were a committed socialist. Famously, of course, in one of those funny moments of history, Kautsky becomes Lenin's foe after 1914. Um, but the one-time pope, pope of Marxism ultimately reneged on his social democratic duty to champion the republic several years earlier during the Prussian suffrage debates in 1910. Kautsky thought that it was possible to bring about working class political rule without breaking from the existing undemocratic state. His um, reneging on this point opened him up to a forceful retort, just a really great piece of writing from Rosa Luxemburg, who insisted on the orthodox social democratic position that the working class can only come to power through the democratic republic. And in her piece against Kautsky, um, Rosa Luxemburg writes that it's by pushing forward the republican character of social democracy that we win one more opportunity to illustrate in a palpable, popular fashion our principled opposition as a class party of the proletariat to the united camp of all of, of all bourgeois parties. It's a really great piece that she uh, wrote in response to Kautsky not publishing her works uh, talking about the, the Democratic Republic. So I've presented a little bit of history. I'm now going to maybe dive into a little bit of theory here in regards to Marx and, and Marx's republicanism. Talk about this idea of freedom from domination. And I'll point out, I think this is a key republican idea, that the idea of, of uh, ejecting to arbitrary power and the ideas of domination. So I'll present Marx's republicanism as an interest in eliminating all forces of arbitrary domination. An extension of Marx's republicanism was his identification of the democratic republic of the Paris Commune as the state form necessary to render the state subservient to society. Marx fought to realize freedom for humanity by eliminating all forms of arbitrary domination, the greatest source of all being the rule of capital. William Clare Roberts identifies three areas that this domination appears in capitalist society. This is William Clare Roberts. The political domination of the workers affected by the state, the objective domination or despotism to which workers are subjected in production, and the impersonal domination experienced by all commodity producers. I think he's right about that. I think that's actually a really uh, succinct way of, of talking about those different forms of domination. Marx understood communism as the struggle of the working class for self-determination and self-actualization, a struggle that would throw all of existing society into the air and free all of humanity from the bonds of superstition and want. Workers strive for a voice in the decisions impacting their lives in order to fully engage in all the meaningful activities of life. With this desire in mind, it's a fundamental problem for someone with an eye for non-domination that capitalist society presents as a vast array of uncontrollable and arbitrary obstacles. Like the sorcerer in Fantasia who enchants a broom only to have it sweep away with abandon, the working class has no control over the society that it reproduces each waking hour. Marx, I think it's interesting to note, was less concerned with stopping bad things from happening than he was with society's ability to collectively, and that is socially, control its fate. The inner workings of society must be clear and comprehensible. Marx, for example, preferred direct taxation over indirect taxation because the former prompts the person to control the governing powers imposing the tax. And I kind of read that as Marx saying, life is tough, but it's, uh, but it's one thing to, to err or suffer because of decisions one understands and has some control over, and it's an entirely other thing and, and reprehensible thing to err or to suffer due to arbitrary forces taking place behind one's back. But also say maybe that's the difference between domination and arbitrary domination. You have some say or some control on what's happening to you. Marx located the source of domination in capitalist society not just in the actions of individual capitalists or politicians, but in the market as a whole, the aggregate of billions of isolated decisions. 
the purchase of commodities, the ability to sell one's labor power to buy necessities, the decision to hire or fire an employee. All of these events are determined not by personal preference or individual proclivities, but by the logic of the market operating outside of any collective debate or deliberation. The most obvious example of the market's impersonal domination is the necessity of finding a buyer for one's labor power or to risk starvation. One may not want to work, but one must work. And I won't read it here, but it's in my notes, but William Clare Roberts in his book, I think, details a lot of uh, other interesting uh, instances of choices that we kind of think are freely made in the sense but are actually ultimately controlled by uh, the logic of the market, so to speak. And it's not just the working class, by the way, who's operating within that frame. Society is immensely unfree under capitalism because individuals cannot gather together in the service of collective decision making and are instead at the whim of their personal force. Everyone, workers who depend on the ups and downs of the market and must labor to survive, the capitalists who must squeeze the surplus value out of their workforce and find the cheapest source of labor power is dominated. I think Marx recognized that. Humans made this world, yet it appears as so much quicksilver in each individual's hands. The task of communism is to take back the world we have created by giving the masses democratic control over society. The overarching obstacle standing in the way of this goal is the bureaucratic, undemocratic, alienated bourgeois state. Roberts writes that so long as exchange constitutes the social nexus, producers will be dominated by market forces, workers will suffer overwork and despotism in their work, and the masses will be excluded from access to the means of subsistence. Yet, the market isn't a god, uh, and the, uh, the events shaping our lives aren't supernatural. Marx explains, this is a quote, if the product of labor does not belong to the worker, if it confronts him as an alien power, then this can only be because it belongs to someone other than the worker. If the worker's activity is a torment to him, to another it must give satisfaction and pleasure. This line I want to highlight, not the gods, not nature, but only man can be this alien power over man. Human relations define capitalist society, and human relations are a matter of politics. That Marx was, in addition to everything else, a political thinker, interested in political projects and political struggles, can't be overstated. He recognized domination is surmountable only through a political project, injecting democracy into all spheres of human activity, and thereby beginning the process of moving towards the complete elimination of private property and a new realm of human relations. It's in this deepening of democracy, I think the willingness to touch private property and essentially, um, I should say, touch private property, property and collectivize the means of production, where Marx takes hold of the traditional republicanism as non-domination and stretches it like a rubber band, if you will. So, there are two more things I'm going to bring up. One, I'm going to talk about the democratic republic as a political solution. Hopefully I'm not losing it. So Marx was eminently aware that individuals under capitalism are unfree in the sense of being endlessly subjected to arbitrary domination. I reviewed that point. The political solution to the freedom problem appeared to Marx in the self-activity of the Parisian working class during two months in 1871, the events of the Paris Commune and the creation of a democratic republic in miniature. During an all too brief two months, the communards made crucial changes to the state. And I'm going to list some of those. Universal male suffrage was enacted across Paris. Officials were to be revocable and accountable to their constituency. The executive and legislative branches were combined, turning the commune into a working, not a parliamentary body. The standing army was replaced with a citizen's militia. All records of the commune's internal activities were publicized. The police were to be under the control of the commune and subject to recall. All judges were to be elected and likewise subject to recall. And finally, every city, village, and town would model the commune 
with representatives from those communes sent to make decisions in higher bodies. This was to be a state form that could be expanded or contracted to kind of fit the needs of this. The state was made subordinate to society. Democratic rights were extended into the workplace, and the division between political and social existence was made a political project. It wasn't solved, but it was made a political project. The communards worked under unfavorable circumstances. It's the history that folks might know. The revolt was isolated and lacked an organized party and clear theoretical direction. While they planned, and in some cases they did carry out inroads into the arbitrary domination of the existing state, they didn't move against the domination of the commodity market. The personal direct domination of the, of the bureaucrat over the citizen and the employer over the worker was reduced. But the impersonal, that is the indirect domination of the market over everyone remained. That's kind of discussing the Paris Commune, I think, through that lens of domination. The fact that the communards didn't eliminate capitalism isn't a mark against them. As I already explained, the revolution is a two-stage process, political and social. Marx explained this process best when he called the commune, quote, the political form at last discovered under which to work out the economic emancipation of labor. It supplied the republic with the basis of really democratic institutions. Karl Kautsky later stated that it was only when the French state is transformed along the lines of the Constitution of the First Republic and the Paris Commune that it can become that form of the Republic, that form of government, for which the French proletariat has been working and fighting. Lenin, in a piece written to recover Orthodox Marxism, offered a provocative take on the transformative power of democracy within the Democratic Republic. I quote Lenin here for a little while. The Paris Commune appears to have replaced the smash state machine only by fuller democracy. That is, abolition of the standing army, all officials to be elected and subjected to recall. But this only signifies a gigantic replacement of certain institutions by other institutions of a fundamentally different type. This is exactly a case of quantity transforming into quality. Democracy introduces fully and consistently is it all is it is as it is at all conceivable to not get is transformed from bourgeois into proletarian democracy from the state that is a special force for the, the suppression of a particular class into something which is no longer the state proper the purpose and that's in the book here, the purpose of the transitional worker state understood Lenin is to run society and hold the bureaucrats accountable by subordinating them to I will add, though, that we, we shouldn't let the grandeur of the commune distract us from what I already kind of got at a little while back, which is the fact that Marx was a champion of the Democratic Republic before 1871. And I dare say he also understood that the state needed to be smashed prior to 1871, even though the change to the um, uh, manifesto is often interpreted as him only discovering that in 1871. I think he knew that already. His demands of the Communist Party of Germany, 1847, which called for a united German Republic and the universal arming of the people, prefigured the Paris Commune by almost a quarter century. Even earlier than that, Marx scrutinized supposedly democratic constitution, constitutions and made detailed lists pointing out their various undemocratic provisions. How great there has a great piece of that. Marx then didn't need the Paris Commune to make him a champion of democracy and an opponent of human bondage in all its personal and impersonal manifestations, be it iron shackles, undemocratic constitutions, or the domination of the market. The Paris Commune did provide Marx, I think, with a greater appreciation for the speed with which the workers would have to subordinate the armed forces of the state to popular control and deprofessionalize the state bureaucracy. That would be smashing the state. So, I'll start heading towards my end here by talking about where that brings us today. And it's at this point that I'll start bringing in some of the Marxist unity group discussions. So, tasks for the day. I think we can say that, that the Socialist Party, the Socialist Party we aspire towards, it embarks on its journey with the immediate goal of the Democratic Republic detail in its minimum program. The 
Party's final goal, communism and freedom, that's detailed in the maximum program. So this is then an argument for a minimum maximum program. The fight to achieve the minimum demand strengthens the working class while making inroads against the existing state. Such demands include a single legislative assembly elected by proportional representation, the abolition of the independent presidency and the Supreme Court's right of judicial review, the election of judges and other state officials, the expansion of jury trials and state-funded legal services, the unrestricted right of free speech, the abolition of copyright laws and monopolies of knowledge, the immediate dissemination of all state secrets, the abolition of the police and the standing army in favor of people's militia, characterized by universal training and service, with democratic rights for its members, and the immediate convening of a constitutional convention based on universal and equal suffrage. Fully enacted, these demands, I had originally written smash, I then crossed it out and wrote dissolve. Kautsky actually uses the term dissolve. Dissolve, smash. Dissolve, smash the existing state. The democratic republic, because connected to society, would remain subordinate to the masses during the transition to Congress. With the state subordinate, democracy would begin to penetrate all aspects of political and social life. Having obtained freedom from the domination of the rule of the capitalist state, society could work towards the excuse, society could work towards the freedom to self-actualize. There's an argument that um, uh, William Blair Roberts makes that Marx can actually take the freedom from and freedom to distinction and kind of combine them into one kind of powerful narrative. Many of the party's minimum demands also appear in its internal organization. Leadership positions are decided on the basis of a one person, one vote, not on the state system. The party minority has the right to become a majority through debate, the formation of fractions, and the publicizing of their ideas. Electives are accountable to the membership, they're mandated to serve as tribunes of the people in the political arena, and they're recallable by a majority vote. Finances and minutes are documented and accessible. Members have the right and duty to express their ideas, especially when they conflict with those in the majority. And ultimately, I'd argue that the party is stronger because of its unity in diversity of opinions and ideas. Debate strengthens the party by exposing all ideas to the light of day and combining the intellectual power and experience of the entire class. Strong argument can be made that, on the other hand, bureaucratic centralism renders socialist parties inoperable beyond a certain size. And just as a side note, I was in the ISO for a few years, and I think it's interesting to look back at that and say, huh, you know, the ISO got to a certain size, maybe about a thousand folks or so, couldn't have actually gotten bigger before it fell apart, uh, or did the internal, I'd say, bureaucratic structure of it kind of render it inoperable when the Bernie Sanders movement happened? That's another kind of side point, but important. Organized around democratic centralist lines, the Socialist Party can also engage in political spaces, parliaments, Congress, etc., that would otherwise swallow up a non-party do-good. As Kautsky noted, it's a strong party that allows for a principled engagement in politics, not the engagement in politics that makes for a strong party. Finally, working within a democratically structured socialist party acclimates the masses to engaging in politics, either directly as party representatives or indirectly by keeping officials accountable. This training in political life and the creation of democratic structures is necessary for the present if the future state is to be subservient to the people. The working class must learn to lead, manage, and account for all aspects of society, an eminently political project. The representatives of the party must learn to subordinate themselves to the will of the majority. Learning how to engage in disciplined and principled political bodies is one of the many ways that the working class, I'd say, rids itself of the muck of ages. In a dereliction of duty, I think that the left all too frequently avoids the question of hierarchies and decision-making by dodging the issue entirely. There's this vague notion of socialism from below. I bring that up just because that was the access to it. Or what amounts to the complete rejection of politics. And that's no solution to the problem 
of keeping leadership accountable, and it actually leads to less democracy. So we're coming to line of conclusion in the last two days here. So I'll return to the three realms of domination and capitalist society identified by Vargas. And I'll quote those again. The political domination of the workers affected by the state, the objective domination or despotism to which workers are subjected in production, and the impersonal domination experienced by all commodity producers. Where do we strike this three-headed hydra so that it stops growing new heads? Which one of those do we kind of take on first? The impersonal domination experienced by all producers won't end once the working class takes state power because capitalism will still exist. Exploring the commodity form is theoretically interesting, but it doesn't really provide us with a way for socialists to engage the working class. The domination of the working class at the point of production will be a constant source of conflict, sometimes higher, sometimes lower, so long as classes exist. But focusing our attention on labor struggles to the detriment of political struggles, as some would critique the rank and file strategy for doing, conceals the fact that the struggle of class against class is a political struggle. If that's the case, then there's one head that remains, the political domination of the workers by the state. I think it's a massive shift that takes place in the class struggle when the working class recognizes the government as a far worse enemy than that of their employer. At that point, the class moves one step closer towards realizing its historic mission of liberating all of humanity because it moves one step closer towards contesting state power. It's to this end that the Marxist unity group reaffirms the DSA statement that the USA is no democracy at all. We emphasize that, and this is a quote, in preparation for the third American revolution, to be a socialist in this country is to be an enemy of the US Constitution. End quote. So hopefully I've adequately described why the demand for a democratic socialist republic isn't, in fact, out of place in the Marxist canon. More could be said about Marx's biography and his relationship to republicanism, especially his break with Hegel around the ideal states as seen in his turn towards the young Hegelians, then his turn away from the young Hegelians as a result of his turn towards communism. And as I've already mentioned, I think Richard Hunt and Bruno Leopold are, are helpful in that discussion. I'll end by saying that I think it's important that we consider how we talk to folks. Um, I'm not convinced, like I once thought, that simply saying the word socialism or responding to every grievance with problems of capitalism is always the best approach nor is it inherently the most radical thing to do. The root problem is capitalism, sure, um, but starting at the root doesn't necessarily make pulling out the tree any easier. And when I was thinking about that in my mind, I think he also said, well, you can't even really start at the root because you have to you know, dig down the roots. Demanding a democratic republic in the United States is a very radical thing. Challenging the Constitution is semi-sacrilegious. I asked a friend of mine in Mug why he thinks leftists are quicker to say socialism than they are democracy or democratic republic. His response was that democracy is harder than socialism, and that it requires more of people, demands more engagement, and a greater understanding of how our incredibly convoluted political system actually functions, or doesn't function. Democracy, I think, is also hard in the sense that it challenges socialists to actually win the masses of people to our ideas. There are no shortcuts to lasting power. If our ideas are correct, then we should not be afraid to expose them to the scrutiny of others. Socialists believe that when democracy is established, their arguments about the need to socialize the economy will have majority support. It's only at that point, then, that we can start uh, taking our first step towards communism. Uh, so now we're going to be going into Q&A. If anyone has questions, I can pass off the mic. Can we just check the lapel mic again, and then maybe Is it on? use that for the audience? Now it's on. Yeah? That's fine. Okay, great. Okay. It wasn't that entire time. Okay. <laughs> so any questions? Um, I wonder how the party, the part of the Workers' Party, relates to the 
to the to the state in the Democratic Republic. Uh, specifically, does the does the party have any kind of privileged position within uh, the UD, the state, or or does it have to be, be compete against um, don't compete against um, um, counter revolutionary um, um, organizations within or influence within the within the republic? That's a that's a good question. Or is it picking me up? Is it? Is the audio good? You can check in the chat. Can you maybe uh, directly to your, I don't know. But. It's a good question. Um, my first thought, you know, if I understand, so so how would the Workers Party relate to the state, um, and then does the Revolutionary Party have to compete against counter-revolutionary organizations? Um, I'd say after uh, taking power, there would be you know, the establishment of this constitution. Uh, so to be a political party uh, in society, uh, those parties would have to agree to kind of basic uh, norms and rules. And then I think, you know, once that's done, once one can then be a political party, um, that then it is up to, um, a party of the working class, a socialist party, to um, to compete with other parties who have maybe different ideas about which way society should go. A little closer. Uh, I'm not very good at this. Thing. Um, I have a question from the chat. Uh, Dame Thomas asks. How do you understand Marxism's relation to bourgeois rights, property, freedom of thought, freedom from arbitrary arrest, etc.? Uh, textbook definition of republicanism emphasizes freedom as coming through collective participation in political affairs, e.g. the Roman Republic. Liberalism, according to Constant, is more about enjoying private rights free from encroachment by the state. These two views are somewhat in tension with each other. Is Marx hostile uh, to the fundamental bourgeois rights, or is republicanism for him related to them? I think that's the question. Um, I can leave the question here also. Sure. Thank you. So in regards to the first one, uh, you know, this right to property, I think, I think that that's what makes Marx's republicanism particularly radical in a certain sense. And I think I brought this up in the sense of um, taking traditional republicanism and kind of stretching it like a rubber band in a way. And that's also what the labor Republicans um, were doing. By the way, it's out of the labor Republicans also that you get um, the Knights of Labor. That's um, out of the Knights of Labor, you get the IWW and other folks, and it's out of the IWW that you get Socialist Party of America. Um, so it's so, so, so that would not be a, a, a part of Marx's understanding of, 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 of a right, so to speak. Um, freedom of thought, freedom from arbitrary arrest, etc. Um, I think those very much fit in with, with Marx's conception of freedom. It's, it's interesting to note, I think, Marx early on um, you know, especially when he's an editor, when he's when he's writing, one of his primary concerns is is with censorship. Um, and some folks, you know, I know might say, well, that's kind of where Marx's interest in republicanism came from, is because you know he really thought that he really took his his writing seriously, and he thought it was necessary to disseminate ideas, and that his primary concern was that those ideas might not be uh, disseminated because of censorship. I don't think that's true. I think his republicanism goes a lot deeper than just a concern for um, you know, freedom of speech and so on and so forth. Um, but that's definitely a part of the project, right? I mean, again, we have to believe that, that our ideas um, you know, will win 
people's hearts and minds, so to speak. And so an important part of that is, is freedom of speech. <clears throat> Hello. Ah. Uh, yes, I uh, was very curious because you mentioned at the end of your presentation that um, the Marxist Unity Group or MUC uh, is uh, is opposed to or is in some sort of opposition to not opposite, but uh, is opposed to uh, the Constitution. And something that I was wondering, a question that came up to my, uh, to me, for me, was uh, in what way Mar the Marxist Unity Group considers its opposition or its, its opposition to uh, the Constitution? Because recently I uh, read this, I read this to a teach in on the American Revolution by Chris Cotron, and something very interesting that Chris Cotron mentioned was uh, the, declar the, the Declaration of Independence and uh, the way that the Declaration of Independence was drafted with, uh, the, with the free first words being, no, not free first words, but the inalienable rights being the rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness instead of life, liberty, and property as it was under Locke. And it seems to me as if the American Constitution in some ways does seem to sort of be, um, be um, very open to this very democratic and bourgeois free ideal and does not seem to be fixated on things like private property. And so I just wanted to know uh, in what way you would consider your opposition to the American Constitution. So I'm very curious. Yeah, thank you. Um, I'll say a few things. One, I think the work of, of um, Daniel Dan Lazar touches on this, and someone kind of turned me on to the fact that it was only with Dan's um, book, the, the Frozen Republic, that was published like the late 90s, I think, or so, that the U.S. Constitution was kind of thrown back into the spotlight of discussion. Um, I'm far from a, a constitutional scholar, um, but I think the Constitution is an interesting document, and, and I think Dan's correct about this, in the sense that um, it grants uh, in that in, in certain slogans it, it simultaneously grants certain kind of um, broad grand ideas of liberty and then proceeds to kind of chip away at those and so it's a very interesting document in the sense that it it, it kind of sets the parameters of discourse uh, by by simultaneously saying you know here is this freedom um, and yet when you actually dig into it you realize that freedom has kind of disappeared um, in some ways then this is exactly what Marx is talking about when he's talking about the difference between um, uh, forget it but the difference between something that's superficial versus the actual content of something um, so I think that's very important to look at the, 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 the phrases that, 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 that something might use at a particular point. And then once you dig down into something, how it actually works. Um, private property, yes, you know, the, the, the rights of private property is, is something. Um, you can also, I think, critique the Constitution in regards to, um, to, to politics, in regards to political representation. Um, you know, I think easy one kind of just being you know the the fact that we have uh, universal suffrage in this country uh, you know more or less not really I don't know uh, but it's not it's not equal certainly having a two two states two two votes in the Senate per state it's not equal suffering um, so there's that as well I'm going to get to questions. There's one more in the chat, then we'll go back to the audience. So one person is asking a few questions, which I'll try to consolidate here. Um, and a lot of them, are, I guess, are about the um, practical tasks of a democratic republic as advocated by Mug. So there are questions about um, how would advocates deal with uh, workplaces or committees which might refuse to submit to the authority of a democratic republic? or at least the, the you know, paradigm that it's forwarding. Uh, how would you relate 
your own politics to the pol policies of the early 1918 um, Russian Constitution, which did not expand universal adult suffrage because employers could not vote. And um, yeah, I think I think that those are sort of the two primary questions. Oh, and then the one other one is. Um, would a democratic republic, as articulated by Mug, um, include things such as rights and duties for everyone and the provision of minority rights, however you might conceptualize it that? That's an interesting point. The first question, um, workplaces or committees that don't submit. Um, It's kind of it's kind of an easy way out. My my first um, my first thought is well, if you have a lot of folks um, who aren't you know who aren't too keen on the program, um, then the socialist movement hasn't done its job essentially. Then it's come to power too early. Um, of course, it's kind of a dodge to say well you know we have won everyone over to our ideas prior to. Um, the class coming to power, and therefore there would be kind of no, no issues. Um, but I have to think about that one. That's that's an interesting one. I haven't thought so much about the you know the what ifs, so to speak. Um, the early nineteen eighteen universal uh, adult suffrage, the early constitution. It's not something I know a whole lot about in terms of the 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 early constitution. I'm tempted again to kind of do maybe a little bit of a dodge and say. Um, Obviously, things take place in a specific context. Um, whenever I hear, you know, something that took place in the context of 1918 uh, in Russia, I'm thinking about both a desire to take uh, the lessons of Marx and of social democracy in regards to the state and in regards to how to administer a state, and then the reality of what. Um, the Bolsheviks encountered upon taking power um, and the reality that they soon faced. So very much this conflict between ideals and reality. Um, rights, there would, there would definitely be, under the Democratic Republic, there would definitely be an extension of rights um, and individual and, and minority rights. I'm not quite sure if this person is implying that there would be a a, a duty for people to act in a particular way. Um, what I will say is that, you know, Alex Gorbich writes a little bit about this when he's talking about um, the labor Republicans and that they had kind of a conception of, an early conception, I would say, of solidarity in a certain sense. Um, and I think that does also tie into, although I'm not super knowledgeable about it, um, Republican traditions in the ascent, in the sense of um, certain states create certain types of people in a way, or there are certain values and certain things um, in people um, that are valued and are seen as important for contributing to society. Um, so I do think there would be over time, certainly, a change in the way people relate to their engagement in society. Um, you know, Marx talks about this, I think, in uh, one of his earlier 1943, 1944 writings. It might be Critique of Right. But essentially, that how we exist now, it seems really strange whenever we're, well, how we exist now, he was writing. <laughs> Seven years before we exist now, but seems seems still applicable. Um, how we exist now, it seems really strange whenever we kind of engage in a social or a civic duty in a way. Um, we're not really used to um, engaging in a way that that seems like we're connected to uh, to a larger whole. If I could push a bit on the last question, sure. because there's a bit of context in the comment, sure. which is, um, I think this is in part relating to the, the admittedly relatively controversial mug position about the abolition of the Senate. Um, the example that's given in the comment is how in Israel, 
the government is pushing for putting quote unquote politics in command, which seems to be an articulation of, of majoritarian politics, i.e. the will of the majority is sort of the will of the people. And so I guess the question that's being posed with regard to minority rights is, is if there's a distinction in minor, between minority groups, how is that sort of mediated with respect to the admittedly also important sort of popular sentiment? Um, I don't know much about politics in Israel. I do know that these days it seems like um, Israel does not have a constitution, um, and it seems like what kind of basic laws that exist in Israel are being kind of rolled back. Um, you know, and as I understand it, that's what's bringing up a lot of protests these days. Um, I don't think that the Senate, as it exists, could, especially in this country, do really anything to protect any kind of rights or, or, or democratic interests. Um, the Senate is, I mean, the House of Representatives, you could say, is you know, maybe in some way related to one person, one vote. Um, the Senate, I think, is, you know, kind of fits that middle ground in the way. If the president is, you know, in theory, you know, who, who, if you're balancing, you know, the rule of one, the rule of some, and the rule of the many, and you have, you know, the president, the rule of, of, a, of, of one, the Senate, the rule of some, the House, the rule of many, um, <clears throat> the Senate, I think, as I said, you know, falls in that, in that category of, of the rule of some. So I, I'd be curious what, 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 I don't know if this person would see some kind of progressive qualities in the Senate, or, or if the Senate, for a particular reason, has the ability to protect uh, minoritarian rights. I'd be curious about that. Um, thanks a lot. Um, as, as far as I understand, the uh, ancient democracy student in Hebrew, he want to build up a um, Marxist mass party. If I understand it right? Yeah. yeah. Um, and, and my question is um, how the demand for a democratic socialist republic is necessary to build up the party. Um, I think in general, you know, if we're talking about democracy as the light and air of the working class, um, and that's something that, you know, Kautsky said, and Kautsky being a member of the SPD, when one thinks of, you know, a mass party, one thinks of the SPD, um, I think it's the idea that a democratic republic is a massive step forward in the um, the democratic rights within a society, and in that sense, then you are massively expanding the amount of light and air that um, that the class needs in order to in order to engage in struggle. Um, and so, I'd have to say that we have more of that light and air, so to speak. Um, that's then very conducive to the conditions of creating um, a very large, uh, a very big party. And then also I'll say, perhaps bring it into how I was talking about the, the internal structure. Um, the democratic structures then within that mass party then allow for, um, uh, for debates and whatnot to actually go on. It would allow for the formation of something, for example, like the Bolshevik party. It would allow for the formation of a faction, you know, within the group that can represent political interests. And in that sense, it's actually then very democratic because you're allowing for different interest groups then to present their ideas for people to think about and gravitate towards and kind of compete against one another. So uh, it's easy to kind of define the radical Republican demands in contrast, like with the Paris Commune in contrast with the French government, but how do you contrast like a radical Republican demand 
from our current republic, right? I mean, is it just a tweaking of a form, like you mentioned, abolishing the Senate? But like, how do you change the content, the democratic content? Is it like so the rat, rat socialist politics that would change the democratic content, and the form is just beside the point? But like, how do you change that content of democracy? Sure. Um, how do you change the content of the democracy? Um, well, I think when you're talking about changing the state, um, it helps to kind of think about what is the state? What, what does the state kind of boil down to? Um, and I think one can say that the state is um, armed, standing, repressive forces, um, and then a large bureaucracy. Um, and so I think then to change the content of state is not just to um, abolish the Senate, expand um, suffrage and demand equal suffrage, um, but is to have those demands that include um, dissolving as much of the bureaucracy as possible and then the amount of bureaucracy or elected officials, representatives that do remain as much as possible immediately making them subordinate to society. So then in that sense, you're talking about those demands in which, you know, folks work for a particular wage, folks are recallable. Um, that's a particular part of the radical Republican tradition that Bruno Leopold really uh, hones in on um, is the demand for imperative mandates. Um, and he talks about how um, after the was after the French Constitution of 1795 or so, the, the radical Republicans really pushed again to have those imperative mandates included in the Constitution because they were taken out. I believe they're in the 1793 one. They were taken out after that, um, and it was just kind of assumed uh, in in a bit of history that's really been lost that to be a, a, a parliamentary representative was to be uh, legally, often there were laws, legally subordinate to um, what your constituency would say. That's, you know, entirely what I do. So that would be one part. Um, and then the other part being the abolition of um, the standing army, those armed forces. That's a, that's a crucial part, um, especially when you're talking about counter revolutions. Yeah, thanks. Hi. Um, if, when I get you right, like you said or showed us that uh, for the orthodox Marxists like Marx and Engels and Kautsky, um, additional to, let's say in a broad way, the social action, additional to that, it would be even as important or even more important, uh, the, let's say, political action that is the struggle for the Republic. Um, and I just wanted to ask, like, is the relation between the two the political and the social uh, action just additional or could you specify a bit more on the relation of both? Before Luke answers also, we have time for two questions afterwards, so if anyone has to ask for a closer Yeah, um, for social actions, talking about strikes, things going on. Yeah, yeah. Um, they definitely, they definitely feed into, um, they definitely feed into each other. Um, and I'd say that, oh, you know, this is kind of me going out on a limb, which is not different from what I've been doing most of this time. But I would say, um, you know, perhaps part of, Mug's project, this project is kind of uh, bending the stick, you know, to use a term that's often associated with Lenin, perhaps a little bit in the direction of more kind of the political in a certain sense, because I think it is an aspect of um, the socialist movement that's been 
neglected um, to a certain extent. Um, there is, I think, a focus or in general an idea that out of social action will kind of arise the um, political leadership and political structures that are needed. Um, and I think we have to, to, to question that. It's obviously not as easy as saying, well, you know, you create the party and then, you know, the social movement arises and it fills the, you know, the party with energy. You know, I think Trotsky said what, you know, the, the party is the, is the steam box and, you know, the working movement is the steam and, you know, we need the steam box to move the, excuse me, we need the steam to move the steam box and so forth. Um, but at the same time, you know, for example, what's going on in France, perhaps. Um, lots of social action, lots of things going on. Um, but, you know, where's the political alternative in a way? Um, you know, society comes to a halt, um, things shut down. What, what political force um, is, is, is going to take, you know, is, is going to step into those powers, is going to step into the spot. It's going to be the same ones that are that you know that that already exist or that are you know prepared to to kind of take action. Um, so of course the socialist movement incorporates all of these things, um, but I say a lot of thought, especially, needs to, to be taken in regards to the political. Yeah. So <clears throat> I think a good period to focus on for framing these kinds of um, discussions is especially like reconstruction of America. I'm thinking specifically the radical wing of the Republican. Sorry, is that? What's your name? Yeah. That's that's cool. Hold it straight up. Um, straight up. Okay, like this? Like, oh, no, that? Face view. Face okay. View. Yeah, okay, cool. Cool. That works. So, specifically the radical wing of the Republican Party. Um, during this time, you have, for example, emancipated freedmen um, holding up as it were, the Declaration of Independence to argue for the bourgeois rights, to argue for suffrage. And you have attempts to pass universal suffrage through the U.S. Constitution um, uh, for blacks and whites alike. Um, so you often have a framing of these problems specifically in terms of the American Revolution, you know, the Reconstruction is often called the Second American Revolution. Um, but that effort seemed to fail, right? Um, you have a sort of evacuation of the Republican Party in the, in the 1870s, um, specifically in response to the old Great Depression. Um, and sort of in response to that, you do have a lot of the cropping up of new labor movements, of socialist workers movements, etc. cetera. Um, so with that in mind, the question I sort of wanted to pose is in what way does socialism, or do you think socialism seems to be addressing a problem or a crisis in democracy? That's, uh, that's a very interesting comment. I think there's a lot to explore in regards to that period in U.S. history, um, Reconstruction in particular, the demands that folks were making in regards to Reconstruction, um, the work of the uh, Knights of Labor and the other you know, labor Republicans in those, those freedmen movements. Um, and the question was, does socialism have something to offer this, this question of the crisis of democracy. Yeah, I think, I think absolutely. Um, and I think that's why um, this, this, this presentation, this topic is, is so important, um, is pushing back against this narrative that would say um, Marx, Engels, the socialist movement um, doesn't, doesn't have something to, to offer that. Um, you know, I think August, August Nymphs wrote a book in 2000, um, almost, uh, only paraphrasing a little bit, called Marx and Engels' Contributions to the Democratic, um, well, I'm sorry. Um, so I think it absolutely does. Um, and I think as uh, the meaning of democracy you know, is, is kind of contested and, 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 and as folks, you know, question what, what good, what legitimacy does democracy have, um, perhaps part of this project can be 
to say, you know, um, what we know of as democracy or what is called democracy um, is is not that. It can be so much more. Um, I think like, uh, you know, for example, the, the, the SPD, the Social Democrats were doing um, in regards to the Third Republic, kind of saying, look, this thing that goes by a certain name, um, it can be so much more. Hey, Luke. Um, so a few times you mentioned uh, Marx becoming interested in what I think you called it something like communist republicanism, uh, something like that. And um, a few times you mentioned saying, you know, our future state will be subordinated to society. Uh, I, you know, you brought up you brought up Lenin's state and revolution, in which. Lenin points out that the reason that the, the reason there is a state is because there is a necessity for the state, which is the crisis of society. And uh, I was curious: is is this future, let's say, you know, future democratic republic communism, is that also to you know uh, go on forever? You know, is is that the end goal? Um, Put it succinctly, I guess. Shouldn't we overcome even democracy? Yeah, ab absolutely. I'm. I'm really glad you you answered that question. Excuse me. You asked. That. I'm hopefully going to try and answer. Um. Because one should be careful not to fall into that trap of thinking that uh, the democratic republic the dictatorship, the proletariat, whatever you want to call it, is the end goal. Um, I know I've had at least a conversation with one person who expressed a lot of concern that even just talking about anything other than socialism uh, as a demand, that one would essentially start talking about the democratic republic and forget the end goal. Um, so I'll say on the one hand, I think that's the benefit of the minimum maximum program in the sense that you have in your program this maximum demand of communism, uh, the minimum demand here uh, for the democratic republic. But then, yeah, you know, the democratic republic is the worker state. It is still a state, uh, you know, as, as Lenin would point out. Um, so the idea here is that the democratic republic um, does over time uh, fade away as the working class, you know, essentially you know, continues more and more to win, you know, win battles and then win the great victory of the class struggle up until the point when you would uh, then get to communism. And then, yeah, in theory, then you wouldn't need, um, you wouldn't need the democratic republic. And then it becomes a little bit more open as to, well, what is, Democracy, then, you know, as, as you know, I'm sure you know, we've talked about it. And democracy itself even implies a state, so to speak, or, or, include, or it would imply the lack of democracy, so to speak. Um, and um, so, yes, I, 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 I agree that the democratic republic is not the end, and that you can kind of very provocatively say, you know, perhaps there is a future, um, and one would aspire towards actually a future in which there is no democratic republic. Maybe even for democracy. Not sure what that means. All right. That's all the time that we have for tonight. Uh, thank you, Luke, for the presentation and everyone for the questions. For people who are watching on the live stream, we will be back on at 9.30 tomorrow. Uh, all our future events are going to be at the University of Chicago for everyone who's here. If you still have questions, come to our coffee break so you can harass Luke then. <laughs> thank you. We're going to five and nine here in Evanston for dinner and drinks if you'd like to join. Cool. I spent a few drinks.